hand and turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 17 this morning. We are looking at Jesus speaking to his church. In the book of Revelations, he gives a message to the seven churches of Asia. Seven means completeness. So he's actually speaking to his whole church. That includes us. And so we need to listen up. That's the title of our series, Listen Up Church. And we've already looked at two of those churches. Today we're looking at the third church. This church is committed but compromised. So we looked first at the the church at Ephesus, and they were busy and working for the Lord, but they'd lost their first love. Then uh, last week, we looked at a church that was struggling and small, but it was faithful, and God commends them. This week, we're looking at the church of Pergamon, and they are committed, but they're compromised. Have you ever noticed that it's not the water in the ocean that sinks a boat? And a, a, a small boat can be in the middle of a vast ocean, but it's cool, it's floating. As long as the ocean doesn't get in the boat. As long as the ocean doesn't get in the boat. And you can be very sure that water will find a way to get in if there's even just one small opening. How many of you know that? Amen. Even just one small opening, the water will begin to seep in. And this has a powerful application to the church because we can exist and we can thrive in the ocean of this world and all of its ungodliness and sinfulness. Being in the world is not the problem. The problem is when the world gets into the church, when the world gets into us. And that's the issue that Christ addresses in his message to the church at Pergamum, a committed but compromised church. Read with me, if you will, Revelation chapter 2, and we're reading verses 12 through 17. The scripture says, write this letter to the angel. And remember the word angel means messenger. So this is being written to the leader of the church, the preacher of the church, so that he can deliver the message to the church. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. That's interesting. The first church, he had one complaint. They lost their first love. The second church, no complaint. This church, a few complaints. He said, I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So to the church at Pergamum, Christ reveals himself as the one with the sharp two-edged sword. And in scripture, a sword is a symbol of warfare and power. But a two-edged sword in scripture is a direct reference to the word of God. In Hebrews 4.12, it says that the word of God is alive and powerful and describes it as a sharp two-edged sword that pierces to the dividing asunder of our soul and of our spirit. So a two-edged sword is an implement of war, but it also represents the word of God. In fact, in Ephesians 6, Paul identifies the word of God as the only offensive weapon when he speaks about the armor of God, putting on the armor of God because we're engaged in spiritual battle. And, And he says, and take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So this is a direct reference to the power of God's word, particularly in spiritual warfare. And as we see Pergamum, It was a Roman city. It was governed by what's called a proconsul, which was a a military leader, not like a governor, but a military leader. So this was kind of a a military state. And and, and they had what was called the right of the sword. 
or the power to execute, and they could use it at any moment, which this proconsul did. He killed a leading member of this church called Antipas, and he had killed many other believers as well. So it's a church that is under persecution. But in this message to the church at Pergamum, Christ reminds them and us that the authority of his word stands above the word of anybody else, no matter what position of authority or power that they may hold. In the end, Christ will have the last word regardless of what anybody else says because he is the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Governments and authorities may be powerful, but his authority is supreme. His power is greater. Ultimately, ultimately, Christ is the one who has the true power of life and death. So we do not need to fear what men may do to us. We need to have the fear of the Lord, amen, which is a reverential awe for God. So no matter what we're facing or how difficult it may be, Jesus is speaking to us, his church today, and he has a word for us. So let us listen up. Let us listen up to the spirit because that is how we will be victorious. And the first thing Jesus is saying to us today is, is remain faithful despite your circumstances. Amen. Remain faithful despite your circumstances. We need to remain faithful no matter how hard the place where we are might be. We need to be faithful no matter how hard the place where we are might be. You know, Las Vegas is called Sin City. And, and I'm sure that that would be a difficult environment in which to live and minister as a Christian. How many of you think it would be? Amen. It would be a difficult environment to have a church, even though there are churches there. But Las Vegas is Sin City. Pergamum is Satan City. And Jesus says it twice. How would you like to put that on your church's website? <laughs> New Life Assembly of God, located right in the middle of Satan's city. That would really appeal to people, would it not? But twice, Jesus connects their location, the location of this church, to Satan. Why? Because Pergamum was a hotbed of idolatry, occultism, and emperor worship. The city was filled with temples and altars to, to false gods, and they hosted these elaborate festivals, and, and they practiced temple prostitution, which were great income generators for the city and for the idol makers and for all the crowds that came and spent their money in the city. Amen? Nowadays, cities love to get these big events and, and, and a lot of these music festivals and everything, you know, and people come in and they're drinking and carousing and everything like that. And the reason the city does it is because it brings in a lot of money, right? And that's what was happening here. So, so they fiercely persecuted anybody who did not engage in these activities and worse yet, if they opposed their beliefs and practices. That's why Christians were being killed. And Jesus is saying to his church, I understand that Pergamum is Satan's city. I understand that this is not an easy place to live as a Christian and to minister. It's not an easy place to remain separate, to remain holy unto the Lord. But this is what I call you to do. Now, you can just imagine the intense pressure that these believers constantly face. Not unlike the culture of today. Although we do not yet face the level of physical persecution that they were facing, or even the threat of death that many of them suffered. But more and more, laws are being changed in our country to make it a hate crime to hold biblical beliefs particularly in regard uh, to, to marital relationships and, and certain sexual relationships. And Jesus says, I know that you live in a city where Satan has his throne. And Jesus wants you to know that he knows where you live too. He understands the difficulties that you face, that we face. He knows the one who is in a marriage that is making it difficult for you to serve the Lord. 
He knows the pressure that you face from the darkness around you on your job or in school or in your family. And it's a real battle just to serve the Lord. And he sees that you have remained loyal to him, that you have refused to abandon your faith in him. You know, in the New Testament, there are two Greek words translated to live or to dwell. And one speaks of a temporary dwelling, but the other means to settle down and stay someplace. And it's the second word that Jesus uses here. These Christians were not looking to, to run away, to abandon the place where God had put them and, and go somewhere where it was easier. This church, these people had taken up permanent residence in Satan city and they were standing firm in their faith because they were going to be light. They were determined to be light in the midst of darkness. How many are determined to be light in the midst of darkness? Amen. Praise the Lord. And so Satan, he wants to intimidate us and he wants to cause us to, to run and to hide, to keep our mouth shut. You know, nowadays with, with cancel culture and political correctness and everything like that, as Christians, sometimes we're afraid to speak up. None of you here, I know. Reach up and polish your halo. Amen. But sometimes we're, we're afraid to speak up for our faith. Why? Because we're afraid of how others will respond. We're afraid that they will attack us. We're afraid that they will reject us. And, and, and Jesus is saying, you need to stand firm. Not, don't be offensive. He's not telling us to be offensive. But he's telling us that, that we need to stand firm in our faith. Just like the church at Pergamum. We need to stand steadfastly on Christ's name. We need to stand steadfastly for truth and righteousness, whatever the cost. And it's likely that as time progresses and, and, and the direction that our country is taking, that it may eventually cost us things like our job. Come on now. To make a stand for Christ. It may cost us our job. It may cost us our financial support. At some point, it may cost us our freedom if we take a stand that is in contradiction to the laws that are being passed. But Jesus is saying that we need to stand steadfastly faithful for truth and righteousness, whatever the cost. We need to remain faithful no matter how hard the persecution. If you look in verse 13, the second part of the verse, he said, you refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. So here is this prominent Christian and he is put to death for his faith. But the people see this, the, the believers, the church sees this and they do not waver. Amen. Even in the face of this type of intense persecution, they stand firm for the Lord. You know, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of information about how, who Antipas was, but tradition says he was actually the bishop of the church of Pergamum. So he's actually the angel or would have been the angel to which this message would have been addressed had he still been alive. So he's the leader of this church in Pergamum and, 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 and he's killed for his faith. Yet still the church, the people of God remain committed to the Lord. It's recorded that the pagan priests in that city complained to the Roman governor Listen to this. They complained to the Roman governor that the prayers of Antipas were driving their spirits, the demonic spirits, out of the city and hindering the worship of their God. What a testimony. Amen. Antipas' prayers were so powerful that these satanic priests, these occult priests, complained to the governor to have him put to death because his prayers were driving the demonic spirits out of town. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May we be known for that kind of prayer. May we intercede before the throne of God so that Satan has to pack his bags and leave Pembroke Pines. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. Antipas was doing damage to the kingdom of darkness. So guess what? Satan targeted him. Let me tell you something. If, 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 if I know we don't have any here, but if you're a wishy-washy, lukewarm Christian, yeah. Satan's not going to bother you. No. He's not, not going to bother you. You know why? You're not doing anything for the kingdom of God, and you're not doing any damage to the kingdom of darkness. So he'll leave you alone. But get serious about God. Start saying, 
like we sang earlier, my life is not my own. I give myself to you so that you can use me. Start really living out that truth. That's when Satan is going to put a target on your back. That's when he's going to put a target on your back. So they complain that Antipas's prayers are driving out the spirits and the governor orders Antipas to offer a sacrifice of worship to the Roman emperor and declare that Caesar is Lord. That would mean he'd have to renounce his faith in Christ because if you're going to serve Christ, you can't worship any other God. Am I right? And so Antipas refuses and he stands steadfast in his faith that Christ is Lord. And as a result, he was executed by being burned to death on the altar of Zeus. And even in the midst of the flames, it is reported that he died praying for the church in Pergamum. Hallelujah. Even as his body melts into the flames, he is praying and interceding for the church. Glory to God. No wonder Christ called him my faithful witness. That's true faithfulness. Amen. What an example and encouragement to us to remain faithful to the Lord despite the pressures or difficulties that we might face because we're not facing anything near what Antipas faced. Amen. Nothing near what this church was facing. May we be counted worthy of Jesus calling us my faithful witness. Do you want to be his faithful witness? Amen. Praise the Lord. The second thing that Jesus is speaking to us, he's saying, recognize the ever-present danger. Recognize the ever-present danger. We are, not maybe, not might, not if, we are engaged in spiritual warfare. The fact that Pergamum was called the throne of Satan, the throne of Satan, a throne is a place where somebody rules from, amen? Amen. So Satan had a ruling, controlling influence in Pergamum. So the fact that Pergamum was called the throne of Satan, you can be certain that the church was facing intense spiritual warfare. This church was located in a city that was Satan's headquarters. In some ways, that might describe the cities in South Florida where there are so many religion, false religions and demonic practices. You know, an April 2019 article in the Miami Herald discussed the prevalence of occultism in South Florida and spoke of how one popular local park, there were dead chickens, roosters, pigeons, goats, pigs, and anatomical parts being found in that park atop a hill that is popular with people who practice various forms of occultism. In Tropical Park, you've heard of Tropical Park, right? in Miami. And so virtually every day they're having to clear off these demonic sacrifices out of this park. Other news reports have highlighted that sacrifices have to be removed on a regular basis from the courthouse steps because these sacrifices are believed to give the worshiper power over their circumstances to help them in whatever problem they may be facing. But just the fact that you see the news media regularly reporting on these issues tells us the prevalence of the demonic here in South Florida. Occultism is prevalent in South Florida. And Paul warns us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. But there are certain places, that's true of everybody everywhere, because when you're a Christian, Satan is going to fight against you, because he is the arch enemy of God and the arch enemy of God's people and God's purpose. But there are certain places where the activity of Satan is particularly intense. That's something Jesus is pointing out here when he calls it the city of Satan and the throne of Satan in Pergamum. And I believe that we live in an area where demonic activity is particularly intense. But you know, the the famed missionary C.T. Studd said, some want to live within the sound of church bells. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. You know, some people want to live where everything is calm and beautiful, but he says, I want to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. The church in Pergamum and the church at Pembroke Pines 
is living out C.T. Studd's life passion because we're running a rescue mission within a yard of hell. And we need to realize that whenever we are striving to live for God, whenever we are faithfully serving him, whenever we are faithfully preaching his word and witnessing and interceding and praying and reaching the lost, we are going to be targeted by the enemy just as the church at Pergamum was, just as Antipas was because his prayers were so powerful. It put a target on his back. It'll put a target on our back. What do we need to do? We've got to be prayed up. We've got to wage spiritual warfare through prayer. And that's what Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, where he says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness. In verses 18 and 19, he continues his teaching on spiritual warfare. And he says, pray in the spirit sometimes. Oh, I'm glad you have the right Bible. If yours says sometimes it's a misprint, you need to get another Bible. He says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere and pray for me too. Now, when he says pray in the Spirit, that is a unique phrase to Paul and it speaks of, of praying in tongues. For folks, praying in tongues should not be the exception in our life. It should be the normal practice of our life. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 14 that whenever he prayed, he prayed in the spirit and with the understanding. So in his known language and also in tongues, in, in the spirit inspired language. So we need to make that a regular practice because the Holy Spirit prays through us and intercedes according to the mind and heart of God. And, and those, those prayers are powerful because they're being prayed by the spirit through our spirit to God according to God's will. And so we know that they will be answered. But prayer is where the spiritual battle is fought and won. And when we fail to pray, we fail. Let me say that again. When we fail to pray, we fail. This is such a timely word for us because we need to pray in the Spirit at all times and on all occasions. We need to allow the Spirit to intercede through us, to intercede against the forces of darkness. One of the main purposes of praying in tongues is spiritual warfare. So we need to be praying in the Spirit at all times on and every occasion, and it is spiritual warfare to defeat the works of darkness. And then he tells us that we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because those that are serving the Lord are targeted by the enemy. They are in war. They are in battle. And they're being attacked in their health, in their homes, in their finances, in their emotions. In fact, you know, over this past year, I, I, I've been talking to a lot of folks in our church and even outside of our church, and you can just hear the battle that people are going through. There is so much that I've never seen the intensity and the regularity of, of how many problems, afflictions, oppressions that people are facing. And it is the attack of the enemy. And that's why we need to pray for one another. We need to intercede in the spirit because you might not know what's going on in somebody else's life. But you know what? When God brings somebody to your mind... You, you hear their name or you see their face and you think, oh, why did, their, why did their name come to me? Why did I see their... That's God prompting you and saying, intercede on their behalf. You don't know what they're going through, but God is touching you to pray on their behalf. So be interceding for your brothers and sisters in Christ who are being attacked in many areas in their life. And then Paul says, also pray for me. Why? Because he was their spiritual leader. And spiritual leaders tend to be the number one target of the enemy. And so we need to pray for our spiritual leaders because they are on the front lines of battle and they are often targeted for special attack just like Antipas, who was the spiritual leader, was targeted for special attack. We need to cover our spiritual leaders in prayer. We need to cover their health. We need to cover their emotions. We need to cover their minds. We need to cover their families. We need to pray for them to be strengthened in their spirit and for God to cover them with his protection. So I put my word with Paul, amen, and I say pray for one another, and please also pray for me. Pray for our spiritual leaders. Pray for our ministry leaders, amen. Praise the Lord. So we've got to be prayed up, but we've also got to be read up because the word of God declared in faith is the sword of the spirit to defeat the attacks of the enemy. 
We need to be declaring the word of God over our lives, over our children, over our church, over our leaders. Amen. We take the promises of God and we declare it. Lord, you have said in your word that no weapon formed against us shall prosper and that every mouth that speaks against us shall be silenced. We declare that right now, Lord God, that every weapon of the enemy's warfare that has been forged against your people will be rendered powerless in this moment. We declare that every mouth that has spoken evil against your people will be silenced in the name of Jesus. Declare the word of God. Declare the word of God. We need to also declare the word of God through, through preaching, through witnessing faithfully because it is the power of God to save. It is the power of God to change lives and it is the power of God to change situations. So we need not uh, be discouraged because we serve the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Amen. His authority is above all authority, all power, all principalities, and all spiritual wickedness in high places. Hallelujah. And then Jesus tells us we must, redu re we must resist the seduction of the enemy to become contaminated. You see, there are two primary ways that Satan has attacked the church throughout history. The first is persecution. We've been talking about that already. This church was undergoing persecution. Antipas had been killed due to persecution. But of course, one thing the enemy often doesn't realize is that persecution backfires on him. You know why? Because generally, whenever the church has gone through per persecution, there is a purifying that brings a greater passion that produces a greater power. Amen? Amen. So uh, Satan's plan to persecute the church often backfires on him. But the second way that Satan attacks the church is through seduction. The seduction to become contaminated and compromised with the world. To contaminate means to make impure through mixture. To make impure through mixture with something that is unclean. This church was faithful. They held fast to their belief in Jesus. However, they had become contaminated by tolerating false teaching that they should have rejected outright. Now the church itself didn't teach false doctrine, but it tolerated and fellowshiped with people who had come into the church and they were teaching something else. And their influence began to contaminate the church. Jesus said it this way, a little leaven does what? Leavens the whole lump. And he was talking about false teaching and the permeating influence of false teaching. Wrong beliefs tolerated will eventually lead to wrong actions, which is what started to happen. Contamination will always lead to compromise. We must guard the truth. As Paul said, we must defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all to his holy people. We must guard the faith. We must fight the good fight of faith. We must contend for the faith that was delivered unto us, he says in Philippians. Contend for the faith that was delivered unto us. Hold fast to the truth. And so Jesus tells us we must, resi we must resist the seduction of the enemy to become compromised. Christ's complaint was that they tolerated some whose teachings were like Balaam. And if you remember Balaam from the Old Testament? Balaam was an Old Testament, a prophet in the Old Testament, a false prophet because he could be bought. You pay him enough, he'll give you virtually any message you want. Mm -hmm. And so he was a prophet for hire who had been hired by a man named King Balak, an enemy of Israel, and he hired Balaam to curse Israel. But every time Balaam tried to curse Israel, God stopped him. God stopped him because God's blessing was on them. In the end, since he couldn't curse Israel with his incantations, Balaam devised a scheme to get paid by telling the Moabites how to seduce the people of Israel with eating things that were forbidden by God and through sexual immorality. And in so doing, when Israel became compromised, the protection of God was lifted off of them. And so King Balak 
could have power over them, he could attack them. The church of Pergamum was fighting a, sim a similar situation with a group of people called Nicolaitan. And they abused the doctrine of grace. You know, doc the doctrine of grace is, you know, that God forgives us and saves us freely. It's not by anything that we can do. It's not by our works, but it is his gift to us. Amen. That's the doctrine of grace. But they abused this grace, this teaching of grace, and they used it as a freedom to indulge the flesh in sinful practice. Said, you know what? You're saved by grace. You can live any way you want. You can live any way you want and you won't lose your salvation. You know, today we're fighting a similar battle in that the doctrine of grace has been magnified in such a way that it encourages people to continue living like the world, indulging in sin. And whenever you try to preach about holiness and separation, that's very rare today and it's called legalism. People call it legalism. True holiness and righteousness is not legalism. Legalism is keeping a set of rules in, tr in order to make yourself acceptable to God. But holiness and righteousness is Christ is living in me. And daily I seek him and surrender to him. And he is changing me from the inside out so that I can live a life that is pleasing and honoring to him. It's not something I do. It's something he's doing in me. Amen? Amen. And we should be being changed day by day more and more into the image of Christ. That's holiness. That's righteousness. But whenever you preach that today, you're accused of preaching legalism. It's a battle. It's a battle that we face. Something else that we're facing today is that many churches are succumbing to political pressure and cancel culture to become affirming and accepting of lifestyles that are clearly forbidden by God's word. And they're saying you can still live that way and be saved. That's Balaam. That's Balaam's message. That's the Nicolaitans' message. But this is the battle we face today. Many have compromised the truth of God's word for the sake of numbers, for the sake of, uh, 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 of uh, societal acceptance, preaching what people want to hear. But that's a sign of the end times. You remember Paul said one of the signs of end times is that uh, preachers would preach to itching ears. He would, they would tell people what people want to hear rather than preaching the truth of God's word. Folks, we must not compromise either in our preaching or in our lifestyle. I've I'm not telling you to be judgmental or condemnatory. We need to speak with grace. We need to teach the word of God with mercy and with love. But we must teach the word of God. We must teach the truth. Amen. Jesus says that if we have become compromised, we must repent. Or he will come and fight against us with the sword of his mouth. Oh, I don't want Jesus fighting against me. Amen. Amen. I don't want him using his word against me. Folks, we must not compromise either in our preaching or our lifestyle if we want to please God and if we want to retain his blessing. If we have compromised, then we need to do what Jesus calls us to do. We need to repent. To those who hear and obey his word, he says he will give hidden manna. What was manna? It was God's provision in the wilderness. It was the all-sufficient nutritional supply of God to his people. And so he's saying that if we will remain faithful to him, he's going to supply all that we need to survive through this wilderness of difficulty and hardship. Amen. He also says he'll give us a white stone. How many of you want a white stone? Do you know what the white stone represents? Amen. <laughs> he says he will give us a white stone. And that was an ancient practice to give a white stone to a person who had been cleared of all charges who had been declared not guilty in court. And it was a symbol of purity, of righteousness, of innocence. And he says, if you will not compromise, I will give to you a white stone. Hallelujah. I will declare you righteous. I will declare you pure. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. Folks, we're all called to be faithful witnesses of Christ. And when we stand steadfast in our faith, we can expect to be persecuted and targeted by Satan. But we must refuse to give in to the pressure. We must refuse to become compromised with the world in any way. And if we have, then let us repent. God is gracious. He's merciful. He will forgive and he will restore. 
But we must also pray constantly in the spirit and we must be saturated with the word. That's the only way that we can walk victoriously. And if we remain faithful, he will reward us with hidden manna, strength to endure, everything that we need in this life to endure, and a white stone, a declaration of righteousness. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. To be a part of the church that Jesus commends, to belong to those that are faithful to him, we first have to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that we have all sinned. There's not one of us that's perfect. And that's the whole reason that Jesus left heaven and came to earth to die for our sins on the cross. He paid the penalty. He suffered the penalty that we deserve. So that now when we place our faith in him, and we repent of our sins. And the word repent simply means to turn away from. So we recognize that we've been living wrong. We've been heading in the wrong direction. And we make an immediate 180 degree turn. And say, Lord, forgive me. I don't want to live that way any longer. I recognize it's wrong. I recognize it's not pleasing to you. And I turn to you in faith. And I ask your help to live for you. That's what repentance is all about. And so when we repent of our sins. And we place our faith in Jesus. The moment that we do that. The Bible says we're born again. We are made spiritually alive. Because before that, we are dead spiritually. The Bible says we were spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. But the moment we repent and place our faith in Jesus, we are born again. We're made spiritually alive. We become a child of God. And we enter into a lifelong relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that is when we become a part of his church. That's when we become a member of his people. And if you're here today and you have never yet repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus and received him as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do so in a few moments. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Or maybe you gave your heart to Christ at some time in the past and you've drifted away, but you can feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart saying, you know what, it's time to come back. It's time to surrender your life to Christ. So if that's you, either for the first time or the first time in a long time, you want to come to Jesus, you want to know that your sins are forgiven, and you want to have a relationship with him, if that's you, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, and I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I repent. I turn away from my sinful life and I turn to you in faith. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and I invite you to come live inside of me. Help me from this day forward to live for you. I give you my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I want to be the first to congratulate you and welcome you to the family of God. We want to help you grow in that relationship with God because that prayer was just a beginning, a starting point for a lifelong relationship with God. And so we want to help you grow in that relationship with God first by sending you a free e-booklet. But to do that, we need your name and email address. So if you'll just do something for us right now, if you would pray that prayer in-house, if you would just text I prayed to the phone number on the screen. If you prayed that prayer online, just type I prayed in the comments. And a little bit later today, you will get a message with a link. Just Click that link, fill in your name and email address, and we will be happy to send you free of charge this booklet to help you get started in your spiritual journey. It's a seven-day Bible study. Just do one short section per day, and it will help you understand the commitment you just made and how to grow in that relationship with the Lord. So please do that right now. Either text or type, I pray, and watch out for a message later today. In the meantime, I want to help you to get started in your walk with the Lord. First, every day, talk to God. He's your Father. He wants to hear from you. He wants to have a conversation with you. He wants to be involved in your life. So talk to him every day. Start by thanking him for the good things in your life. That's what we call blessing. Every good thing in our life has come from him. 
So we always have something we can be thankful for. Our life, strength, our job, our family, our friends, our loved ones, whatever. Whatever's good in your life, thank you for it. And then in any area that you might be struggling or need help, ask him to help you. Invite him to work in that area of your life. Talk to him every day. That's prayer. Secondly, let him talk to you every day. And how does he do that? The number one way he talks to us is through the Bible. That's his message, his word to us. And so if you don't have a printed Bible, just download the YouVersion app on your phone or your tablet. It's free of charge, and you can read the Bible there. I want to encourage you to start reading in 1 John. It's a short epistle, and I just want you to read a few verses every day. Before you read, ask God to help you understand what you're reading and what he's saying to you. As you read, whatever you don't understand, put that to the side. When it's time for you to understand it, God will reveal it to you. But whatever you do understand, then take that, pray over it, and ask God to help you apply it to your life. Do that every day. First John will help you understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us. So it's a great place to start. Just do that every day. Let God speak to you. And then thirdly, get connected to a local Assembly of God church. Of course, if you're here in South Florida, we would love to have you as a part of the New Life family. We have a, a wonderful, loving, and gracious family that will walk alongside of you, pray with you, and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. If you're outside of the South Florida area, then find an Assembly of God church near to you. You can look it up online. Just search Assembly of God near me and it'll come up and start attending but don't just attend put some roots deep down in that church begin to uh, get involved in the ministries and build relationships in the church because that's how you will grow spiritually so get rooted deeply rooted in a local assembly of god church do those three things and you'll be off to a good start in your relationship with the lord now for those who have already placed our faith in christ the question is, are we committed or are we compromised? Are you devoted to remain faithful to God and his word no matter how hard it gets, no matter the cost? Are you determined to pray in the spirit and to be saturated in the word so that you can do battle, so that you can wage battle? If you are, if you are committed to stand fast for God no matter the pressure and to wage war spiritually through prayer, through praying in the spirit and through the word, would you stand to your feet right where you are, even at home, stand to your feet to make this commitment to the Lord? And I want you just to pray and talk to God yourself. Make that commitment to the Lord and ask him to strengthen you in your inner man by the Holy Spirit so that you'll be able to live out this commitment. Everybody lifting your hearts and voices to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you right now because as I look across this congregation, I see each and every person standing to their feet, Lord God. And it just reveals, Lord, the desire of the heart to truly live for you, Lord God. To be steadfast and unwavering in their faith, Lord God. To refuse to compromise to the pressure of this world, Lord God. Father, I thank you for their heart, Lord God. And Father, as we stand before you committing to this end today, we know that our flesh is weak, Lord God, though our spirit is willing. And so, Father, we are asking for the help of your Holy Spirit. Spirit, oh God, that you would strengthen us in our inner man, Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may be able to stand steadfast and immovable in this dark hour in which we live, Lord God. Father, that we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may be able to walk victoriously, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would raise us up, Lord God, as a people of powerful prayer that does damage to the kingdom of God, that will drive out the spirits of darkness in in our community, Lord God. And Father, that we will be a people that boldly declare your word, not only in prayer, but in preaching and witnessing, Lord God, that your name may be exalted and that many lives may be brought into your kingdom, Lord God. Father, we pray this over your people, Lord. Use us as your faithful witness in these last days, Lord God. In Jesus' precious and mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's sing to the Lord. Today I need you, Lord. Just lift your hands to heaven and tell him, let this be a prayer. More than words can say, I need you, Lord. Than ever before, I need you, Lord. More than the air, I need you, Lord. More than the air, I breathe. Song I 
is the cry of our heart especially in these last days Lord God we need you more than we have ever needed you before Lord God hold us close unto yourself Lord God Father by the power of your Holy Spirit help us Lord to not allow anything to come in between and to separate us from you Father let your spirit continue to minister to the hearts and lives of your people and the world that has gone forth may it continue to speak to us throughout this day and this week and let it bring change and strength to our hearts and lives bless your people lord god until they return to your house in jesus name we pray amen amen god bless you may be seated amen thank you so much for joining us this morning we hope that the service was a blessing to you thank you for those joining us by live stream have a wonderful rest of your sunday god bless you thank you for joining us amen